Good to be here. Some of you, uh, some of you may recognize that last name. My my folks were raised over in Murray County near Edgerton, so it's uh, it's, it's kind of like coming home for me. It, it, uh, Dr. Van Scapen called me back in the mid '90s, asking if I he said you've got the right kind of Irish name. You might fit in in this community, and, and uh, want to know if I wanted to wanted to come home. Well, that's that's my dad's home. I was I was raised working in western Kansas in the mountains of Colorado and Arizona, and so I, I didn't think that I wanted to wanted to come back here to southwestern Minnesota. But I've, I've been here twice now in the last month and uh, things have changed a lot since I since I've been here 15 years ago and, and there's a there's a lot of really interesting things going on here I, I kind of wish now that that maybe I'd take Marlon's uh, Marlon's request a little more seriously I think I think you guys have figured some things out and I think there's a tremendous future for, uh, for cattle in this country um, something that you know, I told you about something that I'm that I'm kind of maybe rethinking a little. Something that that might make you rethink what you've been doing is is mineral nutrition. If if that doesn't uh, quite come out right, it uh, and and nutrition as a as a subject is is critical to, to cattle production. In fact, there isn't there isn't anything uh, that's that's more critical. Genetics is important. Uh, there's a lot of things about animal health that are important, but but if you don't if you don't get the right nutrients into those cattle, they're not gonna they're not gonna do what they're bred to do. They're not gonna respond to the to the to the vaccines and the other animal health products. They're not gonna respond to uh, the uh, you know if you're synchronizing heifers. They're not gonna respond to those things if if they don't have the adequate nutrition. Right. So, uh, if we look at if we look at nutrition, we can, we can break nutrients down into four classes. Uh, so, we see fats and carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the the starches and grain, or the or the the uh, fiber and forage, uh, and then and then fats in the in the germ. And uh, protein is the you know it's it's the stuff out of which out of which cattle are made. Uh, now, vitamins and minerals. Minerals break down into macro minerals and then and then micro minerals, trace minerals. Uh, the the energy protein and, and macro minerals. You can think of those as the as the raw materials that that cattle are made of. Uh, on the other hand, vitamins and, and trace minerals. Well, these are the these are the tools that cattle use to build those raw materials in the feed. Uh, <coughs> Um, vitamins are, are critically important. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you much about those today. I'm just going to focus on the on the trace minerals. But these are they're really the, the bits and the blades and the and the welding tips for the tools. So protein uh, protein and carbohydrate make the, the handles for the tools or the or the, the tables for the for the table saws. But the the trace minerals like iron and copper and zinc, manganese and selenium, and then the, the vitamins like vitamin E, vitamin A, vitamin C, those make the those make the bits and the blades that those that those tools are made of. And <coughs> just like just like building fence, if you're out of if you're out of post and wire, you're you're done building fence. You can you can tear some fence out in one place and you can put it up in another place. But you're not going to build any more fence than, than what you had. Uh, but the tools, you know, if your if your blades get dull or your or your bits get burnt, you can still kind of keep going. And and someone that's not watching very closely might not notice a lot a lot of difference in how you're building the fence. But as as time goes on, <coughs> you wear those tools out, it's it's going to have an impact on on how efficiently you build the fence. One other thing that that these, uh, especially trace minerals, but also also a lot of the vitamins are involved in, is is managing the energy that it takes to run these tools. So if, if you cut a board off with a hand saw, you know it takes some energy to run that saw, 
and it's it's the same for cattle. Uh, it takes it takes energy for them to, to do all the things they do, to grow, to reproduce, all those things. Um, if you've got a little fire, it's and, and not much going on metabolically. It's it's not a real big deal. I live in a in a house full of girls, and uh, and I don't know. You've had the same experience, but in my experience, girls light like candles, and they're not—they're not hard to light. They're not hard to manage, as long as you don't put them under the curtains. You can put them wherever you want, and and it's no problem. But if you're going to heat a house, uh, you better have a good firebox and a good a good hearth and a good flue. Uh, I don't—I don't see as many trailers in this country as as we have in our country, but but every year and. Southwestern Minnesota, the first time it gets down to 20 below and stays there for a few days, somebody's trailer burns up because they overstoked their wood stove and their flue wasn't built right, uh, and they burned up their trailer. And it's it's a little that way for cattle. You know, if, if, if not much is going on, if, if life's pretty easy, uh, they get along well, uh, even, on, even on fairly low level of trace minerals. But you put them under, Stressful situations. You put them in situations where they're where they're growing fast, or or they have to deal with new disease challenges. Um, they've got big fires burning, and, and they need they need the tools, and they need the, they need the energy production equipment to go along with it. So, if we if we think about what happens when cattle become uh, well, if they've got if they've got adequate nutrition, everything rocks along normally, and and life is good as we get into situations where uh, we have deficiencies in progressive severity. One of the first <coughs> systems to be involved is the immune system. Uh, the immune system is complex. It, you know, just like a war, it takes a lot of energy to to uh, to fight the little wars that go on in the in the body to keep <coughs> infectious agents out. Uh, the next system to be affected is the reproductive system. So uh, sperm cells and embryos, they've got, they're, they're little, they're tiny, but they've got big fires burning. Embryos are growing fast, sperm cells are, are compared to their size, they've got a long way to go to find that, that egg to fertilize the, fertilize the ovum and, and start the process over again. <coughs> As deficiency gets more severe, we can see we can see problems with growth, or we can even see uh, malformations. So we'll have uh, uh, crooked limbed calves if if manganese deficiency gets severe enough, or copper deficiency gets severe enough. We'll have sway back in in lambs or calves, or we can see white muscle disease. <laughs> in our country, we're we're in western Montana. We're extremely selenium. So unsupplemented cows will give birth to calves that wind up with uh, white muscle disease. And then basically the muscle just turns to scar tissue and the calves are weak and they can't get up and they can't stand. Uh, but most of these other things, we, you know, they're, they're hard to see. If you're, if you're short 3% on, on pregnancy in your cows at the end of the breeding season, well, you may not you may not pick that up unless you're doing some kind of comparative trial. So, uh, what what we at, at Multimen offer to, to deal with those deficiency situations is a is an injectable trace mineral supplement. Now, the first time I saw this product sitting on a client's shelf in in 2008, I thought, why always trying to do with the needle? What we need to be doing? The, well. There, there are some reasons why uh, an injectable trace mineral supplement is advantageous, and and it actually does work very well. The, the absorption phase takes a day. Whatever doesn't get used as it as it circulates in the blood out of the out of the injection site gets snapped up by the liver, where it it enters the the regular uh, trace mineral mineral management process. And so uh, from there, then it's, it's just part of the regular nutrient cycle. So what this does is it, is it enables you to, 
to provide supplement in the, in the periods where cattle really need it. It is not a replacement for year-round oral trace mineral supplementation. Your cattle need that. Uh, it's important, but it is designed to supplement during high production demands or high stress demands or where antagonistic minerals hinder absorption out of the out of the intestinal tract. So in our in our part of uh, western Montana we have a lot of iron and a lot of molybdenum, a lot of molybdenum. And so those two things inhibit copper absorption, especially if you've got some sulfur around and we, we do have that. Uh, iron also inhibits manganese and zinc absorption. So most of the most of the country has has ample iron or excessive amounts of iron. Uh, I did I did read in the textbook about uh, yellow sands in Florida being being a soil type where cattle can become iron deficient. But I've never I've never practiced veterinary medicine in any of those places. Everywhere I've been, iron has been either adequate or excessive excessive enough to cause absorption. So, what are the what are the high demand periods in in cattle production? Well, let's start out with cows. Dairymen call the period from dry off through the peak of the next lactation the transition period, and and beef cows go through the same metabolic processes. Not necessarily that it's the same extreme that that dairy cows go through, but if you think about what's going on. Late in pregnancy, the fetus is growing about a pound a day. The uterus and, and fetal membranes are growing rapidly to support all of that, all of that growth. Uh, I said these these trace minerals are involved in in energy production processes. So calving is is kind of an athletic event. It takes a lot of energy to get that get that process done, and so it takes ample amounts of zinc and manganese and selenium. To, uh, and copper as well to manage that process as, as well as iron. Uh, lactation, the, the cow is is remodeling her udder, getting it, getting it ready for uh, nursing that calf again. She's building uh, building the, the antibodies to go into the colostrum stores in the last two months of gestation, uh, so that. She's got a lot of a lot of metabolic demand. She's got a lot of construction. She's got a lot of remodeling going on, and it takes the it takes tools to get all that done and done well. Uh, once she has that calf, um, she's any, anybody had the had the pleasure of, of pushing a prolapsed uterus back in on a calf? How how big is that thing? 75, 80 pounds. So so cow has a big big remodeling job to do. She's got to take that 75, 80 pound organ and she's got to, in 80 days to stay on schedule, she's got to remodel that into a three to five pound organ that's going to coddle just a little bit of semen and hopefully another embryo to get that process done. Um, and what happens to her if she doesn't stay on schedule? We cut her head off, don't we? We can't, we can't afford to have her around. So she's got a big job takes a lot of tools um, and all that's to say that in cow production managing cows uh, the, the, the mineral requirements vary so if we look at what happens to the, the mineral status of cows through this through their production phase so this graph here the dotted line shows uh, the copper stores in these average copper stores in, in a Set of cows' livers. This solid line is the is the serum copper level, and we go from pre-calving through calving and breeding to weaning, and then back to pre-calving. So the whole the whole cycle. And what happens is that as as cows get later on in gestation, they have a hard time absorbing all of the minerals that they need. In this case, copper out of their diets. So they mobilize those minerals out of their livers, out of their stores, put it into the put it into the serum for one reason, so they can push it across the placenta to get to the calf. Now, part of that is that the calf is growing rapidly. The other part is that uh, milk contains 
very little mineral, very little trace mineral, very little iron, very little copper, very little selenium, and very little zinc. Uh, and so when the, when the calf is born, his trace mineral supplementation is done for as long as, as the majority of his diet is, uh, is milk. So for the first month or months of life, he has very little access to mineral. And, and, uh, and so the cow is pushing, late in gestation, is pushing as much mineral into that calf as she can. And the result is that cows that are, and these were all orally supplemented <coughs> cows, uh, if you get down to about 50 parts per million dry matter in the liver, you're down into the deficient range. So these cows, they didn't quite make it into the deficient range, but they were in the marginal range under 100 parts per million average. So there's some that are higher and some that are lower. Uh, but the, the important thing is that, is that through that period, um, cows lose a lot of minerals. So this is a study we did some number of years ago where these cows got liver biopsies uh, 30 days pre-calving, 30 days pre-breeding, at the end of the breeding season, and then at, at weaning. And what I want to show you here is this was this was Central Texas. Country music singers like to sing about red dirt. If you've got red dirt, what do you have? You got a lot of iron. So uh, this is a little more extreme than, than some other areas, but the point here is that these cows uh, spent almost the whole breeding season in the in the deficient range, whereas those cows that were supplemented with uh, the injectable trace mineral supplement, they dipped down low, touched the deficient range on average, and then rapidly recovered. And I'll show you what the what the effects of those were in, in just a minute. But the point here is that is that this period, what the dairymen call the transition period, is a is a very high demand period for cows. <coughs> cows can have a difficult time meeting their uh, trace mineral needs out of what they out of what they consume orally. So uh, now let's shift focus a little to, to bulls. Anybody anybody here uh, AI and heat detected a string of heifers or a bunch of cows? Turns out it's a lot of work to be a bull, isn't it? Uh, you know we we think these guys are out there living the lives of Riley, and, and maybe they are, but they've got a big job to do, and it and it takes takes the same tools for them to get their job done to produce the semen efficiently, and to and get around to cover the cows to do what we need them to do, and so they need <coughs> tools as well. So when, um, as I said, uh, cattle need an, an oral. A, good, high quality oral trace mineral supplement throughout the year, um, but when can Multimen 90 provide, provide value to your operations? Well, in our country a lot of cows go up into the, into the high rugged mountains uh, and, and don't have access to trace mineral throughout the whole summer because cattle get tired of trying to haul, haul mineral into that steep country and they get tired of feeding the deer and the elk. So they, so the cows go on their own. Uh, as I said, the absorption phase is, is within a day, so within the week that we give it, we can get the cows straightened out in terms of their mineral status. Uh, for those in, in deal with that, with that time frame, for those of you that, that aren't in that production situation, uh, it's, it's safe to give pre-calving, so as long as as long as you're comfortable running cows through down an alley, heavy cows down an alley, um, it's the multi-min 90 is safe to give. So for any of you that are given a scour's vaccination or handle those cows to to re-pour them later in the later in gestation, that's actually ideal. If we can get uh, the trace injectable trace mineral supplementation out into here. Those cattle are, are in their, uh, those cows are in their peak period of, of needing it. And then again, uh, 30 days prior to turning the bowl out, help that cow finish up her remodeling process, get ready for the next breeding season, and then have the trace minerals that the, that the, the embryo needs to get through that, that period where they're, 
where they're pretty uh, uh, pretty fragile. You know, we talk about not shipping cows uh, 15 to 35 or 40 days post AI because the the embryos are fragile during that period, and part of that is that they're very susceptible to to oxidative stress. The fire is burning out of control, and part of keeping those fires under control is having adequate trace mineral levels. And we've got some studies that have shown in time the embryo transfer that uh, that the early embryonic death rates are <coughs> in, in multi minute supplemented uh, efforts. So. Bulls, uh, we the the semen that a bull ejaculates on one day, he started working on 60 days previously. So it takes a little while to get uh, to get the, the the trace minerals incorporated into the tools. So we recommend 60 to 90 days pre-breeding. Just finished up a study, or in the process of finishing up a study in South Africa, looking at the effect of multi-min 90 on mature bulls, and uh, they've seen effects on the on the breeding soundness exam as, as early as 45 days post injection improvements in semen quality. Um, but uh, given that given it time to work, we don't have any specific data about the value of multi men at, at turnout. But if you if you think about what typically happens to bulls when you turn them out in the beginning of the breeding season, they tend to lose weight. They've got a lot of other things on their mind other than eating. And so uh, uh, we think that there, there may be some value to give in multi-min 90 at, at turnout as well. So I've made some recommendations, but if we're going to ask you to invest some money in our, in our product, uh, there's got to be some benefit for you. So this, this is that uh, Central Texas study that I told you about, 80% 80, um, 80 of the of the control cows, those cows that remain down in the deficient range for copper bread, whereas among those cows that were given the multi-min in 90 the injectable supplement, 94% of those got pregnant. Uh, Kansas State University study that we finished up a few years ago, Kansas is not as challenging from a trace mineral standpoint as Central Texas. Um, and, and these cows were well supplemented. Uh, Casey Olson, the nutritionist in charge of those cows, did a, a good job of making sure that he had a good trace mineral package and they got adequate consumption for the three years before we started that study there. But even on that herd, we still had a 3% improvement in the, in the pregnancy rate. And then a study finished up last fall at Northwest Missouri State. Uh, these don't look like very impressive pregnancy rates, but they're not. Their conception rates to, to one-time AI, uh, and they wound up with 65% with pregnant to, uh, to artificial insemination, which is a pretty darn good uh, conception rate to artificial insemination, but the, those cows that got a, a multi-min supplement uh, had a 9% point improvement. The Kansas State study, they, that, they also did AI on those and they held the, the cleanup bulls out for 10 days so that when they ultrasounded those cows, they could have a hard, uh, hard figure on the number of cows that bred AI. And they, again, found a 9 percentage point improvement uh, to those cows that were given a multi-min supplement. So, yeah. Do you have any data for fixed time AI if you inject them? Using a seven day C or you end up about 10 first time through the shoot, you treat them 10 days ahead of breeding. Right. That is what, say, I've been doing, but I know it's recommended 30, but you don't have them to shoot 30 days ahead. Exactly, Where exactly. You're synchronizing everything, you've got them there 10 days ahead. If it picks up the mineral in a day, yep. is there? It, it might. We don't have any specific data. Um, and, I, and, it, and it does take time for the mineral to get incorporated into the into the enzymes where it where it has its effect. Um, so so we think we think it may be beneficial at 10 days. The the timed embryo transfer study that I talked about uh, that was at 17 days. They they had a, a synchronization program using estradiol. 
that was 17 days long. So the first first time they handled those heifers was 17 days prior to the time to bring them transfer. Did not see an improvement in cyclicity in those heifers, um, but but did see an improvement in pregnancy at 23 days by by. Um, ultrasound and then again at, at 45 days and and that that study was where they showed that um, the, they they all all heifers lost some pregnancies between 23 and 45 days but the, the multi-men supplemented heifers lost fewer pregnancies than the, than the control numbers. so uh, the data we have would, would indicate that we don't have an impact on cyclicity, but we do have an impact on, um, on, on retention of the fertilization and retention of the embryo at when given 17 days. So that's not quite as short as your 10 days, but, uh, but getting closer. Um, so if we look at the impact of, uh, of this, we have a uh, uh, on that Kansas State study, that, so there was a 12 percentage point improvement in the number of calves <coughs> calving in the first 20, 20 days of the, of the calving season. So this is a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, those those cows have 20 more days to to involute, get ready to breed before the next breeding season. Those calves have 20 more days to, to grow before weaning. Uh, we also cut down the number of <coughs> cattle buyers point, sort them off. Um, heifers and bulls kept into the replacement pool. They've got 20 more days to grow before, before they need to get through puberty or, or 20 more days to get through puberty and be ready to breed. So uh, we've shown the same effect on heifers. These are, these are a couple of studies looking at, at pasture developed heifers with access to free choice minerals. <coughs> Uh, improvements in the in the pregnancy rates of those heifers. Now we do have just study just got published looking at at multi men in heifers that were weaned onto onto a total mixed ration, maintained on that total mixed ration throughout the entire development and breeding period, and and we did not see this benefit. So if you've got absolute control through a trace mineral. Uh, or through a, a total mixed ration, um, there's no harm. Uh, but we did not in that study. We did not not show the benefit that we show in these pasture development. So, uh, bull development. We just just finished a study at K State this past year where bulls were yearling or weanling bulls were treated with multiman at weaning and then again at 10 months. And we saw 3% more of the treated bulls pass their, their urine BSE. Uh, <coughs> talk about calves here real quick. So to get from here, a wet calf to a, to a calf that's well able to nurse. Um, selenium is involved in, in producing the active form of thyroxin, the, the, the hormone that calves use to manage their metabolic rate. So if you got calves that are born in warm weather, they need to pump those thyroxin levels up and selenium is involved in that. And so uh, one of the things that I've, that I've had clients tell me in Montana is that the calves that get home they minute birth uh, seem to get going going quicker. We don't, we don't have any data to, that would support or refute that, but that's what, that's what I've been uh, I'm sure you've all seen graphs like this. This is an old, old story. We don't ever get tired of telling. If, if those calves get a good dose of colostrum at birth, they've got high levels of, of antibodies early in life, and they're pretty disease resistant because of it. Uh, same thing happens with calves that are born to cows that are well supplemented. The calves will be born with two to five times the mineral levels in their livers that their dams have. Um, but by weaning, these calves are growing fast, their immune systems are, are dealing with all the pathogens that they're now faced with in life outside the uterus, and so they, 
they can consume a substantial amount of the mineral that's in their liver by the time they get to turnout. So uh, I don't know if, if, if you guys tend to vaccinate calves before you turn them out. In, in the West, we tend to brand everything at a couple of months of age before we turn them out onto the, onto the range. And so uh, there's an opportunity to, to provide some value to those calves again. And then as they get through the summer grazing season out toward weaning, uh, it's it's actually quite common for those calves to be to be deficient, and so if you have calves that are that are getting deficient, uh, one of the things that'll happen, at least happens frequently in our country, is is we tend to see a lot of late summer pneumonias. And, and Dr. Jeff Hall at the University of uh, uh, or Utah State University, a toxicologist there that does a lot of of mineral assay and serum and liver. What he's found is that among those cattle that have been confirmed with a bacterial pneumonia, free weaning in that country, 93% uh, are either copper deficient or selenium deficient or both. And so in that case, we talk about we talk about these things being subclinical, but if you've got sick calves late in the grazing season, uh, the only thing that's hard to see is, is the sub in the subclinical. So, uh, yeah, looking at this big strap and bull calf here, this, this cow, she's proud of it and she ought to be, but what do you notice about the coloration on the, on the ears, down on the forelegs and the dewlap here? It's getting a little light. Anyone know why that is? Copper is involved. Uh, is, the, is the active point in the enzyme that produces melanin from the, from the amino acid tyrosine. Melanin, that pigment, pigment melanin gives black, uh, gives black, makes black hair black and red hair black. It's the, it's the pigment that gives hair color. And so one of the th first things that you'll see when cattle get copper deficient is the, is the coloration begins to fade out. So, uh, we're running short on time, so I won't talk a lot about this, but the, uh, again, the immune system, it, it requires selenium to get the, get the white blood cells out into the tissue where they have their effect. And once they get there, for the white blood cells to gobble up the pathogens, it takes copper. And then once they've gobbled up the pathogens, it takes iron, uh, and it takes copper to to handle iron correctly. Uh, it takes iron, copper, zinc, and selenium for the white blood cells to build the fires and control the fires that they pour on top of these pathogens that they've engulfed to uh, consume them and then to run the immune process. And so the uh, this is a study looking at, at multi-min 90 given at uh, the same time as a modified live virus IVR, and uh, the multi-min supplemented calves produce higher titers than the, than the controlled calves. And this is a log scale, so a quarter of a log is, is a 75% higher titer, almost, a, almost double the titer. Uh, we, we talk about mean titers, for example, but what we really see is that Whenever we vaccinate cattle, we have some that respond at a very high level, some that respond the way we expect, and then some that respond at a, at a lower level, and oftentimes some that, that don't run to respond at all. A uh, recent study that we did looking at immunity, these are, these are copper, liver copper levels, and they're high, and these are liver selenium levels, and they're, they're adequate. Uh, the, but the thing that I want to point out is that these calves were vaccinated on day zero and again on day 21, and the control calves, they, that vaccine, that vaccination, the response to that vaccination took a lot of mineral and, and pulled mineral out of the liver. Even in the calves that got multi-men, they, uh, they still lost mineral out of the liver, but they maintained <coughs> copper and selenium levels better than the calves that you did not receive an in injectable trace mineral supplement when they were vaccinated. So the result of that study, we had 
roughly half had a 4x response, a, a four times increase in titer uh, than, the, than the control calves, whereas the multi-min supplemented calves had a, uh, 80% of those. And so if we think about uh, herd immunity, a herd that responds at a higher rate has fewer susceptible calves when a pathogen is coming in from the outside and if a susceptible calf gets infected, there's, uh, there's fewer susceptible calves for that one to, to transmit it to. So we, we make the uh, uh, chance of an outbreak of infection a lot lower. So uh, that, that covers the stuff that I wanted to, wanted to share with you this morning. If you have any questions, I went through it all pretty quickly. And uh, I'd be, be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I'll be around.